Okay, we are happy now to be joined by the great Sam Fortier, Washington football team beat reporter for the Washington Post. You can find him on Twitter at Sam, the number four TR. Thank you, Sam, for joining us. We appreciate it. And welcome to Ref the District. <laughs> Chris, Trevor, thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. Before we get into all this Washington football team talk, because we're going to talk quite a bit about that in the short time that we have you. You were the beat reporter in 2019 for the Nationals. And that was a that was a World Series winning team that you followed the whole year. So I got kind of a, a two-part question on that. One is, what was it like to follow a world champion for an entire season? And then number two, are you like us, just blown away at what this team looks like now compared to what it looked like just two years ago? Two You're talking about the Nats. Yeah, the Nats. Yeah. yeah. I mean, both both teams that, that I covered have, have gone through pretty crazy transformations. But to your point, I mean, surreal, I guess, is like the word that comes to mind when I think about like what it was like covering that Nats team in 2019 because I was out in L.A. covering the Chargers for the Athletic. I got brought in. My first day was was opening day, and I actually went up to Philly and I rode some some I, I rode a bus with some Phillies fans down in Nats Park because that was Bryce's first game back. Uh -huh. So like my introduction to the beat was like a brawl in right center on the concourse between Phillies fans and Nats fans. I was like, "Whoa, what's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> what did I get myself into? Right, and I remember I was in Milwaukee when they got swept by the Brewers, it was mm -hmm. right before, it was like the series before they got swept by the Mets, I think to go 19 and 31. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in that clubhouse because it was, it was Carter Keboom's first call up, made a couple errors. And it was, it was like deathly quiet in there after the sweep. And I remember Jake Knoll was up because they were injured and Kurt Suzuki got hurt. And I was like, am I about to cover this team for, for five more months and have them be <laughs> out of it the entire time? And so like, <laughs> like, the roller coaster ride that we went on afterward, I mean, my B partner, Jesse Doherty and I, like, that was one of the most surreal, special experiences of my life because, I mean, growing up, like, I was a big baseball guy, and, and, and I know that baseball seasons don't normally end that way. So, for them, I mean, after that, it was, it was just kind of a ride. I remember, you know, being in Detroit when Fernando Rodney and Gerardo Parra come in with their glasses in the boom box for the first time, like, yeah. you know, Max with, you know, in the black eye I mean that really was uh was a special experience um and 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 to your second question what does it look like now it's like you know I was um I was out at Nats Park just because I had some friends in town and, and I hadn't been to a game in a while uh you know before the deadline when everybody was still there and it was just surreal to see not only um not only the changes that have happened but also you know, I, it was a Patrick Corbin start and it was, man, that slider two years ago. I remember that thing being dominant. Yeah. What happened? So, so yeah, it is, it is pretty astounding to kind of think of how much has turned over in two years. Hmm. Rev on you, buddy. All right. Well, let's get to why we're here, Sam. Enough <laughs> of that America's greatest game. We're going to talk some football. So um, training camp, you know, preseason first game has already happened. Um, so now we're in the second game coming up tomorrow. Uh, my first question is kind of a two-part. How do you feel about, I guess, before the concussion, Samus Reyes's uh, chances on being a part of the 53 and then uh, Jarrett Patterson, his real chances of being the 53? Yeah, both great questions. I know both fan favorites. Um, mm -hmm. I think I feel a little bit better about Samus Reyes, though I would say, like, both of them, I think, have really impressed coaches. And I want to start mm -hmm. by saying that, like, the amount of money they gave Samus Reyes, the fact that they took him out of the international player pathway program, like that alone tells you that Marty Kearney, who was down there in Florida to see his workout at, at UF, mm -hmm. that tells you, you know, they really like this kid. And, and obviously, mm -hmm. you know, he, he just played his first football game. He's got a long way to go. But when you look at some of the blocks that he made, the physicality that he has, that's not something you expect to see as a basketball player. So, right. <laughs> right. So he's got a concussion right now. Um, you know, didn't practice. So to me, they could either, you know, if this injury is a, is a serious thing, maybe they IR him and he stays on IR for the year, or maybe, you know, he makes the 53 
and then they put him on practice squad. I don't think that you'll see him get cut on August 31st because then that exposes him to everybody else. So right now, I imagine, you know, he has a pretty solid chance to, to be with this team in some capacity after a cut today. Garrett Patterson, I think the same thing. I think he has a, has a good chance, but I think he has less or, or he, his circumstances are, are a little tougher just because, you know, they didn't give him that big signing bonus. He was an undrafted free agent. Um, I know they're trying him out uh, at, at kick return just to see, hey, what else can you do? Um, and I think to me, obviously he had a really nice first game, but if you're going to be that third or fourth running back on the roster, you really got to contribute to special teams in some way. I think kick return might be a tough way or, or something that he's not as experienced in. But mm-hmm. when you're talking about a back that can, that can run the ball up the middle, that, that, can, uh, that can catch the ball out of the backfield and do what he does, I think you'd like to have that guy on your roster in some capacity. I think that's a good point about uh, Reyes that really a lot of us hadn't thought about is that when they saw him and the, and the amount of the signing bonus, they had to probably outbid some teams in order to, to get him. So they obviously like him. And it wasn't just one of these things where, Hey, let's see what you got. This was, they saw something in him, right? Yeah. Especially for someone, my bad, I mean to cut you off, but especially for someone who's never played the game of football. Yeah. They obviously had to see something. Yeah, to me, it, it kind of goes back to when Pete Hayner earlier this, the tight ends coach, was talking about mm-hmm. Logan Thomas earlier this year and, and him saying, oh, I think Logan took another step. He can be a top seven, top five tight end in this league. When you look at the measurables, you know, the arm length, the size, the height, the weight, the, um, you know, the quickness, Santos Reyes checks all those boxes. So is he a two to three year project? Probably if he's going to be a legitimate contributing tight end to this team. But at the same time, if you're thinking about a Super Bowl window for this team, if they can find that quarterback, that's probably around the same timeline. So I think that they feel comfortable investing in a guy and not saying, hey, we need you to be a, a 30 catch guy, you know, a, a, a big right, part of our right. sub package right now. All right. Okay. Nice. So. Trap key season has arrived, Sam. <laughs> he made the move from safety to cornerback. Um, I got him and Tory McTire seem to have been getting a lot of noise too in training camp at the cornerback spot. Is that a battle that is a real battle or, or is it just something that's just for entertainment? <laughs> yeah, I think Tory McTire has certainly stood out. I mean, that dude, um, I think coming into camp, I thought, Dale Roberts might be that guy in the slot. He's a little more veteran right. guy. You know, he's got that flexibility. They, they signed him in that second Same. wave of free agency. Mm-hmm. But he has not made as, no, made as much noise as Torrey McTire. And I think Torrey McTire, you know, I'm not saying he's going to be their, you know, one of their top three quarters. I think that's pretty solidified. But could he be that fourth, fifth guy? Could he be a pretty solid reserve if someone gets hurt? Yes. I think Trav Key while he has made some notable plays that, you know, he's, he's had some really nice pass breakups, which people like don't give him enough credit for. I think he might be still a little too green at that cornerback position, you know, with some leverages, with some things that we've seen in the field to, to merit that, that roster spot. I think, I think he's definitely on the bubble, maybe on the outside right now. So when you talk about practice squad guys or guys who are maybe destined for the practice squad, when they get cut in that first, the big wave right before August 31st, um, are those guys now just complete free agents and anybody can sign them and not necessarily to the active roster, right? They can sign them to their own practice squad if everybody agrees to it, right? So you, so you have the chance of losing some of these guys that you really want for your practice squad for future development. Exactly. So, like... That's why I think, you know, my beat partner, Nikki Jabala, and I talk a lot about um, what this team is going to look like after cut down day or, you know, oh, who, who's going to be here? Who's going to do that? And I think it's a misnomer maybe after those initial cuts come out to say, okay, who made the 53? I don't think that that's a good reflection of the, of the roster because they're looking around, okay, who did, the, who did so-and-so cut? Who did so-and-so cut? We like this guy. We played him in the preseason two years ago. Now he's available. Do we like him a little bit more than maybe our last corner or our last running back? So it wasn't, it wasn't the case last year because I think because of the COVID protocols, but normally teams turn over a lot, but you know, the bottom half of your roster will turn over a little bit um, because of who other teams cut. So 
Yeah, it is. It's a total free. Uh, it, it's kind of like undrafted free agents after the draft. It's chaos, and, it, and everyone's yeah, on the phone. And people are trying to figure out like who's available, who's going here. Um, and so that's what it'll be like after you know 4 p.m. on August 31st. And this team will obviously try to get better uh, in that facet as well. So we got game number two coming up against the Cincinnati Bengals home game. Brand new field, brand new this, brand new that. Um, what can we expect in tomorrow's second preseason game since the normal preseason schedule is cut down again to three? What can we look for as far as who's playing? And if, are there any position battles that are key that can become more clearer after tomorrow night's game? Yeah, so I think with the reduction in preseason scheduling, I think you might see this be treated like that third preseason game used to be. Get the starters, you know, who knows, a couple series, maybe a little bit more than New England, let them get up to speed and then rest them in the third. I know Ron Rivera is the type of guy who is, does not like to rest his guys. So you're going to see, I think, the starters out there for, for at least a, a couple series um, tomorrow night. And, and so I think you're going to see that. I think you're going to see a couple position battles, uh, particularly that last receiver spot and, and returner. Um, I think – you know, it, it used to be, in my opinion, the two-man battle between DeAndre Carter and Steven Sims, but you've seen seventh-round pick Dax Milne really come yes. on strong um, here in the last couple of weeks. It's been impressive. He, he's got some, uh, you know, certainly some some reps with the ones. Uh, I think you're going to be looking for Jamin Davis to maybe make a little bit bigger of an impact than you saw against New England. And I think this, the safety battle um, – you know, how do they figure out those top three safeties in Bobby McCain, Landon Collins, and Cam Curl? How do they get them on the field in what capacity? And, and one more, I think the biggest uh, transition in terms of lineups is you're going to see Eric Flowers at left guard instead of Wes Schweitzer with the first team. So those are kind of the battles I'm looking for. And then if I can keep rambling and go one more subplot for you. Of course, bro. Go uh, ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think um, – William Jackson the third is going to take his couple series against his old team. And I think this is going to be personal for him. I was thinking that too. He's been taking subtle shots all week. He has been taking season. subtle shots. <laughs> he said, you know, he made a joke about Washington's defensive front. Actually, you know, he said, he said, uh, oh, it's great. They're actually helping me for a change when he talked about <laughs> yeah. that. Front. And uh, mm. I went back and I looked and if you look at the targets, uh, you know, his, his uh, metrics when he was targeted in Cincinnati and they only rushed three or four, he had a much tougher time than when they were blitzing. So you can kind of see, okay, maybe, you know, and, and I know they played man about 80% of the time. He said he's playing a lot more zone, playing a lot more different coverages here. So I think that William Jackson III is, is going to do his best to show out tomorrow night. Do you think – He doesn't even care who's quarterback. Yeah, he yeah, he doesn't care who it is. Uh, do you think there's been a little bit of noise, at least on, on our side, the fan side uh, of training camp about William Jackson and, and he doesn't seem to maybe be popping like you would expect the big free agent acquisition to be popping in camp. Is that, is that just noise from us fans and that we're just not seeing him every day uh, either shutting guys down or, or playing really well in camp? No, that's something that, that I've talked about, you know, even out there, you know, when I see Terry beat him or, or someone else, I say, you know, hey, you know, this isn't maybe the kind of the level of play that, that we expected, but I think there's there's two things there. I think that one, you know, sometimes Terry McLaurin is just really good. Uh, and yeah. you saw that last year uh, against Cincinnati. I mean, William Jackson certainly gotten him a couple times as well. And there was one play I remember at the end of a, a, a red zone period where for lack of a better term, like Logan Thomas just lost him. And I was like, okay, like if you put him on a tight end, like that could happen. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it's not as bad, but I think the reason sometimes that people, including myself will be like, Hey, what's going on is because that shift to zone has been, you know, I think a little bit tougher than, than maybe I expected. Cause he said, you know, this is a hundred percent different than what he was doing in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. and, and we're talking about yeah. transitioning techniques that like, he was telling us the other day about um, this, this technique in, in zone coverage called T-step, which is basically like when you come out of a, you know, you're back you're coming out of a break and trying to be patient. Like that's something he's doing in the grocery store. That's something he's doing at home. Like <laughs> yeah. his girlfriend was giving him a hard time about it. Like yeah, when you, when you're doing something that different that you've been doing for six years, you know, even at Houston before that, like it's going to take a little bit of time. And so to me, 
the question is for someone who last year, uh, I'm, I'm a big nerd. So I, I like EPA expected points added, um, you know, some of the advanced stats, but if you look at the advanced stats and you look at the tape, like he was elite man corner last year. I know Terry got him for one, but he was, he was really impressive. So to me, the question is almost how does Jack Del Rio push those buttons? Uh, when does he say, okay, we need you to just take away this, this side of the field. Uh, or, or when does he say, um, okay, we need to mix up and play zone because that's what's going to help us here. So to me, I think William Jackson III may, you know, some of it might be Terry being good. Some of it might be maybe he, he wasn't at, at the point where people thought he was. And, and some of it is, you know, they're just running a whole bunch of different stuff right now. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trevor, you got another one? Uh, or are you tapped I do, out? but I, I'm good. I mean, we can keep going <laughs> as go long as I'm go good. All right, so I've I've caught a lot of flack on Twitter here lately about my Jam- my Jamin Davis take. Um, he didn't show me anything first preseason game. I know it's first preseason, but here here's my opinion on that. He's a top twenty pick, and we're giving him a brand new role to play his first year in the NFL, and it's causing him to not trust his instincts and misread things and look kind of lost and kind of frantic on the field. Uh, do you think he's it's something that he can quickly adjust to, or should we just stick to what he knows and put him back to what he was doing in college? Yeah, to me, this is this is sort of uh, I, like let me let me put it this way: I wasn't as concerned when you see some of those things that you saw against New England because I was like, okay, you know, this is probably what they expected. Week one of the preseason, the first NFL action this guy's seen, um, just in his development, like. I guess the question here for, for your take is, is how much do you trust Ron Rivera and Jack Del Rio to have evaluated correctly and then be able to develop well and fix some of these mistakes they see on tape in a linebacker? And I think like skepticism is totally warranted, right? Because if you don't see, it, see him produce right away, then it's like, okay, well, you know, why isn't he there yet? But at the same time, it's okay. Like if, the, if, if you're going to put this guy at Mike and, and he did play – you know, a, a fair amount of Mike at, at Kentucky, um, or some, some at least. Uh, how much do you, like, how, I'll figure out how to phrase this right. Like, how much do you trust them to figure this guy out, to get him where he needs to be? And I think that, like, the reason that I am less dire about it or less urgent is because when you talk to people behind the scenes, it sounds like he is going about his business in the way that he needs to. And so, okay, you know, the play isn't there yet, but maybe it takes him half a year. Maybe it takes him, you know, most of the season to figure it out. And, and obviously like you had that luxury with Chase Young where, where, you know, even though he started a little slow, he was still impacting the game, even when he wasn't getting to the quarterback, yeah. but, yeah. but what kind of leeway can you give this guy? Um, so I don't know if I really directly answered your question. <laughs> no, you're good. I, I just I guess it enough just... <laughs> where like, I feel like you got to. Uh, right. Hey. You did good. I guess my, 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 my beef is he's a top 20 pick. So I guess I'm expecting a little more because he's a top 20 pick. Right. Rather than someone we can develop that we go get later on in the draft. That's I guess that's my biggest beef. So. Right. And I think, hey, I think nah, them, you did great. I think him, them putting him at Mike is an investment in like in the long term. Like, okay, Jamin, like, you know, if you're not making all your calls super crisp, if you're not identifying, if you're not hitting holes in the way that we would expect you to, um, like we, we think that'll come. Because when we asked Ron Rivera, you know, and I remember we were at a charity event with him out in, out in Northern Virginia, you know, who is that Luke Keekley type? Who's that versatile linebacker that you think can diagnose? And because I, you know, I thought from, from what he had talked about, that he might have been thinking it was Cole Holcomb, but he was like, Jamin, mm-hmm. Jamin Davis, that's the guy. He's, he's going to be, I'm not saying he's Luke Keekley because that man is, you know, right. he's elite. Yeah. But I think that they think the potential is there and they're willing to give him this, this runway to figure it out. Gotcha. All right. Last, last question. That's all I Sam. have. That's all I have. Last question. <laughs> um, the offensive line, which – They've got a lot of versatility there. They've got guys oh, yeah. who can play left side. They can play right side. They can play guard. They can play tackle, all of that. The only thing that concerns me, and again, this is probably just because I'm a fan and, and I don't know the insider <laughs> of it, is you've got a lockdown uh, of Sheriff at right guard and Rouye at center, but everybody else is kind of 
some guys are playing at the ones and some with the twos and some are playing guard and tackling. And on one hand, that's versatility. But on the other hand, the way I look at it is nobody's like taking that position and saying, this is my job. I am the Mm -hmm. left tackle and you're going to have to take it from me. And those got, nobody has done that. And I don't know if that's a, if that's a good thing, or we should just be happy that there's a, a few guys who can play that position. Yeah, to, to me, I do think they, they have a left tackle locked down in Charles Leno. I, I think he is that guy. Is he that guy beyond this year? He's on a one-year deal? I don't know. I, th- I don't think they know. But to me, I think they, they, they have tackles locked down at left with Charles Leno and right with Sam Cosme. And, and I know that Sam Cosme is, is a guy who, you know, the part of the reason they made that Morgan Moses move in releasing him was because they went through OTAs and, and minicamp and they saw what Cosme could do, and they said, okay, he might be a little bit ahead of even where we thought he was. So I think those two positions are locked down. To me, the big question is, is left guard. I think that's the unresolved one uh, between Wes Schweitzer and Eric Flowers. I think that Eric Flowers, certainly when you get the start in week two, when you play with the ones, when when you do the the solid job that I think he did against New England, especially in run blocking, he was, he was impressive. Um, I, I think that that's the position where you, you want to see who's going to come out and dominate their reps uh, that mm-hmm. they get, because they, they've, you know, shifted around Wes Schweitzer, Cornelius Lucas, David Sharp. I mean, all of those yeah. guys, Steve Charles, like all of those guys have played different spots. And I think that's in anticipation of, of, you know, not necessarily that these guys aren't winning their jobs, uh, particularly in Sadiq Charles's case. I think they're throwing him everywhere because if you remember last year, I think it was during that Lions game that that um, Cornelius Lucas got hurt and Morgan Moses had to go to left tackle because David Sharp yes. was playing yes. left tackle. Yeah. And like, you know, when you're starting Morgan Moses at left tackle against Cincinnati, like that's not the best combination for your line. Not because it, it reflects on Morgan Moses to play left tackle, but like asking your starting right tackle who's played that position for like five years to shift, like that's not your best combination. Like no. you need continuity on that. Like I think coaches, I think metrics, I think everyone would tell you continuity is one of the most important things on, on a line. So I think they're just cycling all these guys through just to get a better sense of, okay, Sadiq, if you need to play right guard or uh, Cornelius, like if you need to go to right tackle, like how's this going to feel? Um, so I think that left guard spot is a battle, but everything else I think is, is just experimentation and, and trying to make sure what happened last year didn't happen again. All right, Sam, uh, we know you got to run. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to join us here on Ref the District. Again, that's uh, Sam Fortier. Uh, Washington football team beat reporter at the Washington post. You can find him on Twitter at Sam, the number four TR again, Sam, we really appreciate you joining us here on ref the district. Yes, of course, Chris, Trevor, thanks so much for having me. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we'll hit it soon. For sure.